uh, whether you've been with us before or you are a newbie, you are absolutely welcome here. We are the Academy of Scoring Arts. We're a nonprofit and we deal with the intersection of music and media. So wherever uh, music is written to be married to media, um, we love talking about it. And we're largely educational, community-based uh, nonprofit. And uh, we're here to help each other get better at what we do and hopefully inspire you. Um, today's event is kind of more, I don't want to say instructional, but it's more about like the technical side of, of what we do. But, you know, many of our other events feature uh, talks with composers in our industry or, um, or film teams. And then uh, many of you also know us from our score studies, which we do a lot of where we will take uh, a composer's score and we'll deconstruct it instrument by instrument to be able to figure out what makes it tick, how it was written, how it was orchestrated, and how it works to picture. So those are some of our favorite events we um, we love to do. We have a, a bevy of plans planned for this year. Um, we are just in the final stages of being ready to publish that. So probably in the next week, week, week and a half, we'll be able to let you know all the things we have planned for this year. And with that, I always say it, but I want to reiterate it. We are entirely volunteer run volunteer based. So if you end up liking what you see and you want to be a part of some of it, we absolutely welcome you in. Uh, there's a volunteer form on our homepage, um, on, our, on our website that you can fill out. You can say, hey, I, I like doing this kind of thing, this kind of thing, this kind of thing. And um, we'll just keep you in the loop when we're working on those things. And uh, our plan, we've been working very hard on our plan for this year. We, we were, were really planning to be very active with, with a lot of new projects, new scores, new guests. Um, we're also kind of navigating a return to in-person events, uh, which is, for COVID reasons, is fairly straightforward, but um, finding venues, uh, everything has changed post-COVID. Uh, venues that we used to use are no longer available or have changed and are no longer suitable. Um, so we're on the hunt for good venues in Los Angeles where we can uh, host our events. Because some events, like we we do love being together and love, you know, having a meal together and and getting a chance to network and talk with each other. Uh, we'll, for those of you who are not local, we will still be doing uh, virtual events, I'm sure. And those of you who are orchestra or philharmonic members have full access to all those videos uh, during your membership. So uh, definitely feel free to check those things out. Let, let us know if you like what you see and we will uh, we'll stay in touch. So like I said, there'll be a lot more information about that stuff coming out in the next week and a half. I assume everybody who's in here has got to be uh, one of our three membership tiers, including the free ones. So you'd be on our mailing list. So you'll get notified about all that stuff as it comes out. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, so today is basically part two of what we call our workflow workshop, because we have a lot of systems that we use both internally and individually technically to make our events happen. And um, Last time we talked a little bit about our score prep process and how both how we organize it and how we make it happen in Steinberg's Dorico. And today we're going to be focusing a, a little more on our mock-up process, which is really a process that many, most, almost all composers um, have a need of nowadays because you're writing music and you need to be able to mock it up unless you have fantastic budget and can afford live players right from the moment your pen stops hitting the paper, proverbially. Um, most of us have nice. examples in one way or another, and uh, we all want our mock-ups to be as good as they possibly can be. So um, that's something we actually spend a lot of time at the Academy of Scoring Arts doing as we're preparing our mock-ups for our own events, but as individual composers for our own scores. So it's something we're all, we're all trying to get better at and master the latest techniques. So I hope that what we cover today will, will be of use to you. I, I'm sure it will be to me because this is something I do day in and day out. So... With that, I'm going to introduce our vice president of the Academy of Scoring Arts, Reuven Herman, and he's one who has captained a lot of this process for the scores that we study here. Um, so he has a lot to share, and we uh, we also we're very like we're very conversational. We love the input. So if you have thoughts or questions on what you see, please feel free to put them in the chat, and we'll incorporate them on a rolling basis as we kind of as the conversation unfolds. We love just hanging out, shooting the breeze. This is not like a professor preparing a professional presentation for two hours. We're all in this together is what I'm saying. So uh, if you have a tip that uh, is not mentioned on screen, feel free to put it in in the chat. We will uh, talk about it. So with that, Reuven, I'll turn it over to you and let's uh, let's see where we go. 
Thanks, David. Uh, good morning, all, or uh, evening, or middle of the night, wh whatever it happens to be uh, where you're located. Um, so, like David said, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, mockups and and sort of showing you um, at least the the uh, basics of of my setup and and my workflow. Um, so, please feel free to uh, to chime in and and ask questions. Uh, this this really is uh, um, intended to be a way for for uh, any of you to uh, feel comfortable to jump in and, and help out with our uh, with our mock up process uh, as we study new scores. Um, so I'm not sure uh, how many of you were were uh, on when we did the uh, score prep uh, event a few a few weeks ago. Um, so I'm just going to sort of go over our basic setup in terms of uh, who who does what and, and how we figure out who's working on what so that we don't have uh, overlapping work. Um, so let me uh, share my screen here. And there we go. All right. So that's, as you can see, my uh, Cubase score, but I'm going to bring this up here. So, um, although I realize that th this is not, not very filled in. Um, so we, we use uh, Google Drive to, uh, to organize uh, what we're working on. And basically what we do is we have the spreadsheet where we divide, we divide up the, the score or the piece that we're, we're uh, working on into sections. And then anybody who has offered to help out with the uh, with our uh, queue or with with the score can put their name in here. As you can see, we've got a bunch of uh, volunteers uh, who have uh, added their name over, over the years, um, and and you can select it. So if if I'm going to be working on, I see Peter put him, himself for uh, for mockup. I think he he actually did a lot of this mockup. So some of this is. Uh, is looking at stuff that Peter has also done. If if I were to say put my name at bar two sixteen, uh, I would mark it there, and I can also uh, choose to do just just some of the uh, instruments. So if there are certain instruments that I know that I'm particularly uh, qualified at, or even better that I play live, I know D David, you've recorded uh, live trumpet in the past. We've had players record violin, horn. Um, other instruments I'm probably uh, forgetting at the moment, but uh, you can put yourself down on any and, and all of these, depending on on how much time you have, uh, what your what your uh, capabilities are, etc., and and do however much you're comfortable with. Um, so the yellow means that it, it, you put it down, you're working on it, and green means uh, you finished it. Um, so again, I don't want to take too long to go over that, but if anybody has any questions, let me open the chat window here and, and uh, David, you can uh, keep me alert if, if uh, I miss anything uh, in the yeah. chat. Yeah, I'll chime in. I'll also just say the way that we all stay in sync is we, we start with a master tempo map that someone has done before we even start. That way, everybody's recording to the same tempo map and that it can all be assembled later too. Right. So... Let me show that uh, briefly here. I don't know why my audio file got chopped up here. Let's bring that back to the beginning. Um, so this is the recording of the Superman suite that we've been using and um, my click is off. So I'm just gonna play. So we're all we're hearing here is the recording. So we've already gone over that. You've, you've hopefully all uh, recognize that. Uh, Barbara, I'll, I'll get into audio interface very briefly in, in a minute. Uh, let, let me just uh, finish talking about, about uh, the tempo mapping. So um, if I go back and turn on the click, you'll hear that everything is exactly on beat. And if I expand my, uh, my tempo window here, you can see that there are actually quite a few uh, tempo changes going on, even minute ones. Um, and so hopefully I'm not going to screw anything up uh, by doing this. I'm going to 
create a new tempo map at 120. So now if I have the click on and, and the uh, music on, you can hear that it's nowhere near the same. So uh, in, in brief, in Cubase, and this, this process differs a little bit from DAW to DAW, um, what we'll do is first of all, I always wanna have the, uh, the meter changes in first because otherwise it gets a little trickier. So in this case, uh, I went through the score and, and made sure to put in the uh, meter changes as they appeared in, in the score um, at the proper bar numbers. And then I'll, okay, let me pull up the score here, which I think I need to reopen. Um, I'll take a look and see how many, how many bars the score, the Q is all together. Uh, so in this case, I go to the very end and it doesn't actually have a bar number. So I'll go back to the last bar number, 265 and count from there to figure out that if, uh, if I recall correctly, it's 273 bars. And Cubase has this cool function called the warp tool here. Um, and basically what, what that can do is I can grab, let me zoom in on 273 here. It's actually 276 is where I am. Um, I can grab a bar and move it or a beat or even uh, an eighth note or what, whatever division uh, I want, I can, I can choose my division here. Um, and so I will listen to the score and in this case, I can sort of see that sounds like a downbeat. We can see that indeed that is the downbeat of let's say 273. So very quickly, I will grab bar 273 and drag it and line it up right around there and zoom in and I can let me expand this so that we can see the waveform. I can more or less line it up so that if I turn on the click and the click is not going to match, but uh, all I'm listening for is that the last click hits this last uh, downbeat. And couldn't really hear the click, but uh, it's, it's close enough, at least for now. Um, and then I'll go through, and in this case, there are three different sections. So I will figure out where each section is. Um, and line up the beginning of each section with the proper bar number. And then I'll go through and line up usually each eight bars or whatever the phrases are. And then I'll go through one more pass and, and listen to the whole thing with the click and, and make fine adjustments here and there to uh, line everything up. There's a few places, I'm gonna go back to the original tempo. Um, so you can see that bar I'm going to play it for 145, and let me so so we're only going to hear um, the original recording. I'm going to turn it down so we can hear the click. Um, so the tempo gets pretty uh, all over the place here because it, it slows down as we get into the Superman main theme. Um, so just listen to the click with with the recording for a few bars. Sixty one BPM down here. Okay, it didn't change. It's about to get slower. Fifty six point seven. I haven't calculated this, I've just used the warp tool. Nineteen BPM because there's there's a uh fermata there or or a uh molto ritardando. Um so basically time is not moving, but the click still has to move because we're at Let's say tempo, and then we're at our new section, and now we're around 74, 71 BPM. So, um, Char uh, Charles asks, uh, how do I see the downbeat? And it's it's a little tricky. I mean, I, I can zoom into uh, zoom into the waveform. But sometimes you'll have a timpani roll going into it. You can see here at bar 156, the, the peak is actually not on, on the beat because it's got that crash, which the, the attack is, or the, the, uh, the, the loudest part is actually after the beat. Um, so I'm using my ears. 
I'm I'm just fine tuning it and going back and forth and just li listening one bar at a time to see if it makes sense and I'm often air conducting to <laughs> to see if uh, if my conducting uh, matches the beat. Um so so it's it's really using using your ears more than anything else. The the waveform can give a little bit of help but uh, often can mislead you as much as it helps. Um, and thanks, Dan, for, for uh, uh, pitching in with, with Pro Tools. Um, that's, yeah, I wasn't familiar with that. That's good to know. Yeah, let me let me jump in here. Um, I was actually having a conversation literally yesterday with Aleph, and Aleph is our volunteer coordinator, and we are talking about making a series of tutorial videos on how to do exactly what Ruben just showed in greater detail. But it, the process is different for each DAW, so there'll probably be a few different videos. Um, so if any of you have video making experience and feel like you might be able to explain it in a screencast, uh, definitely get in touch with us. I'm a DP expert, so I can show you the parallel way to do this in DP. Um, whether you're Cubase Logic or Pro Tools, um, we'll be publishing videos on that probably sometime this spring so that you all can get up to speed on the finer details of how to do this well. But um, yeah, that's, this is a great overview from Reuven on how to do it in Cubase. Thank you. And, and I, I, I have done it in, in Logic as well. Mm -hmm. um, Logic has Beatmapper, which is not quite so helpful. The other issue with logic is in logic, you have to work from, unless they've changed something uh, since the last time I did it, you have to work from beginning to end. You can't do a, a larger overview and then go back and, and fine tune the middle because every change you make previously affects everything following it. So, um, you know, Peter says he can show how it's done in Reaper. So basically every, every DAW has the ability to do this uh, to, to greater or lesser uh, effectiveness. Um, but this is this is simply to match um, the our tempo map to a performance, uh, which helps in, in two ways. One is it means that that as we're mocking it up, our mockup mimics a real performance and, and isn't uh, rigid the way mockups often are, my my own included. Uh, and the other thing is you can if you're uh, playing in whether uh, uh, sequencing or live instruments, you can play along with the recording, knowing that everything's going to be together. So you don't have to rely on on whether something sounds good by itself. You can you can just play along with the recording, um, and and right. it does lead to to some very well. This is not synced to video. I, a little bit later on, I'll pull up uh, a mockup that we did of uh, of Mars, which was actually in sync to a video of, of the performance and if i uh if i solo our uh mock-up elements or just some of them it's pretty incredible to see how <laughs> we're watching a live orchestra we're only only hearing a little bit and what we're hearing is, is not real uh but but it's uh i mean i i find it really uh useful just to to have that live uh live performance um Actually, I'll add one more thing, which is something that Joe Kramer uh, said as a guest of ours several years ago, which is one of the ways he got so good at uh, at mocking up and making his mockups sound good, is he would do the same thing. He would he would tempo map his mockups, and then he would a b it with the actual recording until he couldn't hear the difference. I don't think I'm going to make that claim myself because uh, I always feel like uh, the live live recording sounds better, but uh, that's certainly a, a good uh, a, go a good goal to aspire to. Absolutely. Yeah, so the beauty of this process is once one person, it's really a one person job, has has tempo mapped that the entire piece of music that we're looking at, that can be exported as a MIDI file. And that MIDI file is portable to all platforms. So whether you're doing mock-up work in you know, any, any of the major sequencers, you can import it, you can have an exact copy of what Reuven just created, and then we can all work from there and everything stays in sync. Right. Yeah, of course, live recording always sounds better. We, you know, in our dreams with our mock-ups, I mean, I would love to have every instrument live recorded. Um, it's not practically possible, but we, we, we make our attempts at it when we can. Yep. And, and just to go back to this uh, spreadsheet here, you'll notice that, that below the divisions, the first item is indeed tempo map. So if we're working on a new score, and you want to tackle this yourself, please, by all means, uh, go for it. Uh, 
don't, don't have to wait for uh, for somebody else to get the process started because really everything else depends on this or almost everything else. So, um, yeah, and and uh, I I know I promised Barbara to answer your question. I'm I'm using a uh, UAD Apollo interface. Um, I'm I'm on Mac in case. Uh, it wasn't obvious from from the uh, menus at, at the top of my uh, screen, uh, but but uh, uh, which one? I'm using a Thunderbolt interface, the the uh, UAD two quad. So it's got uh, eight in, eight out, and, and supports uh, the UAD plugins, which which use its uh, DSP. Um, but the truth is, you you can use even the built-in uh, interface uh, on your computer to, to do this stuff, obviously you'll be more limited in, in terms of uh, how much you're able to do, but, but uh, I've, I've worked that way in the past or something like uh, Focusrite uh, Scarlet uh, 2i2, which, which is very simple. Um, so, so uh, yeah, don't, you don't need the most uh, expensive gear to, uh, to get involved. We've had people uh, working on, on very uh, humble setups who, who have done amazing work and, and uh, contributed uh, really greatly. So, um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's uh, a good way to put it. I mean, there's so many interfaces out on the market, and and most of them are are of a you know a very high level quality. Some even higher than others, but that's largely a function of budget and. Um, and your input output needs, like how many channels you need, how many mic pre's do you need for the kind of work you do. So, but the the reality is you can get, you can, like Ruben said, you can get working on nothing with just your built-in audio, or you could get working on the very cheapest interfaces if that's all you need, or you can scale up from there. I, I'm also in the universal audio stuff. I've had actually more problems over the past few years with the universal audio stuff, and I'm actually thinking about leaving them, but they do have DSP, which is nice if that's, if that's a priority to you, so. Yeah. And I want to uh, uh, echo something that my uh, teacher at Berkeley, uh, Sheldon Mirowitz, uh, said, um, or more, more accurately berated uh, our class about when, when somebody was complaining about uh, the, uh, their equipment not, uh, not having enough capabilities. And, and Sheldon uh, had, had uh, gone to school in, in the late 70s at Stanford uh, in the age that the very first samplers uh, were, were being developed and, and very early synths. And he said, well, look at all the examples of great music that, that were made using these really basic things. And back in the day, um, this is well, well before my time, uh, you, you would get a hardware sampler with, I believe, uh, cartridges that had one megabyte of, of uh, ROM on them. And um, those cost like ten thousand dollars a piece and you could only load one sound at a time and so uh if you ever feel like uh like what you have is is uh inadequate um shut up and stop complaining because because uh you, we, we've got it so good these days as, as far as uh what what we can do with the technology at extremely low cost yeah um, I'll totally agree with that. I mean, I'd rather little listen to the Beatles on a cheap, crappy, noisy cassette than I would, you know, the world's most awful garage band in a garage, you know, but recorded with pristine interfaces and mics and everything. Like the quality of the music always outshines the technology uh, for the most part. But Ruben's right. I mean, the bar for the equipment that we have access to nowadays, even with built in um, specs, is it, it really is very, very good. So, that's not the barrier anymore. The barrier is more us as creatives to actually use the stuff and write good music with it. Yeah. It's the artist, not the brush. That's a great other way of saying the same thing. Yes. Half the words, yeah. And, and, and that's a good segue into, uh, into our, next, uh, our next part, which is uh, gonna be focusing more on um, the mock-up itself, which I know a lot of you have, uh, have, have tuned in to see. Um, so you can see I've got I've got uh, Cubase open here, um, and if if you're able to see the names on uh, on my tracks, most of these are uh, BBC Symphony Orchestra, the Spitfire uh, Library um, or Orchestral Library. Which honestly I don't 
generally use the, the reason I uh, I'm using it here is I know at least some of you uh, have the the free version or the $50 version I, I think they started giving away for free the BBC discovery orchestra um, or or the regular version and while har hardly comprehensive that is an amazing uh, tool to to get practice uh, right a great starting point as, as David said um, and so so there's really no reason that anyone shouldn't go and grab it uh, I know Peter will, will say that uh, Reaper uh, is available as a free DAW um, and anybody who has uh, a Mac gets GarageBand with the with their Mac and, and can load plugins. So while some of the more advanced uh, techniques that I'm gonna be showing are, are not, you're not able to do in GarageBand, there's there's no reason that you can't start doing this uh, if you have nothing more than a computer. So, um, so this is what you're seeing of my template. I'm gonna, use my handy short uh, shortcut command here and show what my template actually looks like which is these are all my woodwinds my brass um way too way too much stuff here um percussion pitch percussion keyboards harps strings everything is uh, color coded more strings lots of strings and then i've got tracks to load things locally uh, if i want to load them locally so um I've got lots of options. I don't like to need to scroll through all of them. So Cubase has this great search function where I can search for say a flute. And uh, like I said, I've got too, too many uh, instruments here, but if I wanna go to my flutes track, there's my BBC uh, flute uh, articulations uh, track. Um, so, uh, I also have another uh, key command to show only tracks with with the uh, regions on them, which is, which makes it much more manageable in terms of what I'm actually showing. And and I've also got things hidden. I've got different uh, instruments lined up here that I might show a little bit later. Um, and uh, Andrea, you you uh, or Andrea, you you uh, anticipate my next. Uh, answer which is um hosting everything in vienna ensemble pro on on a second computer so we're gonna do a little bit of uh, inception uh, world here dream within a dream or a shared screen within a shared screen um so this this is my vienna ensemble pro in, uh inst or uh, uh server project thank you uh file menu um which I can see is not connected at the moment to my uh, to my sequence. I'll have to fix that. Um, but I've got it separated into instances for each uh, section of of the uh, orchestra. PHB, which I picked up from somebody, is piano, harps, and bells, uh, or the P could be pitched percussion because basically all the pitched instruments. I've eventually come to the conclusion that it's better to separate those from from non pitched perk uh, woodwinds and and all all of this is is uh, meticulously uh, organized. Some would say far too meticulously. Um, it, the, you can really go down a rabbit hole of uh, organizing everything. Um, come on, Vienna Ensemble Pro, you can do it. Uh, well, if if it decides to respond, I'll uh, I'll, I'll come back and, and show that. Um, so let me get that out of the way. So basically, each each instance or each track here, rather, which if, if you're familiar with the Cubase icons, is, is a MIDI track, is connected should be connected to a. Uh, okay, that that would explain why uh, V Pro is not responding. It's supposed to be connected to an, an instance of a Vienna Ensemble Pro. Um, there, there are so many uh, questions and answers about the most efficient and effective way to uh, to, to put all that together. Let me uh, restart VE Pro here. Um, and 
I have discovered that fewer instances is is better, more efficient um, than the ensemble pro. But in terms of the exact uh, number and and uh, multi threading, etc., there there are a million uh, different answers, and and every company uh, lays the uh, responsibility at, at at the feet of a different company. It's very hard to uh, to get a sense. So a lot of it is trial and error, and just figuring out what works. As you can see, sometimes things don't work, and and uh, you have to. Uh, yeah, I, I actually uh, updated VE Pro just a few days ago to the most recent version, which the good news is it supports uh, VST three, which is a, a major uh, benefit. The bad news is it seems to be maybe a little unstable. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try and get that back up. The truth is, what I'm gonna show. You might not be able to hear it, but but I'll, you'll still uh, see what's going on there. Uh, yeah, Alvaro says uh, supports it, it. It definitely loads VST three. So um, how how stable it is uh, remains to be seen. Um, so. What does the process look like of, of uh, doing a mock-up? In this case, the, this is uh, the first part of the uh, Superman March, the, the third uh, part of the suite that we're looking at. So I actually start um, by importing the MIDI from Dorico or exporting the MIDI from Dorico um, rather than, than playing everything in from scratch. So, so this is what the MIDI looks like imported. Um, Pretty much without cleaning up, I got rid of a couple tracks that that didn't have any uh, data on them. Um, so as you can see, every everything is named the way it is in uh, in Dorico. So one interesting and in my opinion useful uh, uh, feature of Dorico. Um, do I have Dorico running? I don't. Watch that. Is each instrument is actually its own instrument. In other words, with most scores, you have flutes one and two on a single staff. And um, OK, that's not what I want to see. Um, it in let's get that out of the way. In Sibelius or Finale, if you export uh, MIDI, you're going to have far fewer staves, but you're going to have two, both flutes on a single staff or, or um, three, st three staves for six horns, that sort of thing. And in some cases, that can be useful because if, if uh, the instrument is playing uh, Atu, then you can, you can put it on an Atu track and it'll play. But if it's a solo instrument, it gets really tricky. Um, whereas here, it gives more flexibility because if if they're playing, if the instruments are playing unison. So, as an example, I'm going to open up flutes one and two, and as you can see, let's make this a little smaller. Um, I'll zoom in here. And I can see that these are actually playing unison because I'm only seeing one line. Then, then here, they go to playing two, two different parts, this uh, offsetting uh, trill. Um, so when, when, when I take this, these tracks, I'm copying them onto, well, I've got two, two flute tracks here. Um, I'm going to go up until the trill, which I see is at bar 169. And I'm going to delete my single flute. Now, here, here's the first case of where I'm making a, uh, a judgment call. Um, yes, I, I will, uh, we'll discuss it. Um, so with the BBC Orchestra, there's not actually a two flutes patch, there's a three flutes, and that's true of, of all the woodwinds. So I need to decide whether I'd rather have a solo flute or three flutes, assuming that I'm limiting myself to, to BBC Orchestra, which for, for the sake of, uh, of this, I am. 
uh, I'm going to say, okay, three, three flutes is, is closer to the sound of two flutes because you, you have that uh, multiple instrument sound that you don't get with a solo instrument. So I'm actually going to keep it with three flutes. And then once... I think we're getting some noise from somebody. <laughs> Make sure your mics are uh, muted, people. Um, once I get to these trills, I'm th then, well, in this case, this is just flute one. Now, I don't have it set up this way in in my template, and and I'm going to show you what I would do in, in my particular case. But in order to get two flutes playing two different parts, well, either you need two flute tracks, or you need a single flute track which can play two different things. So I'm going to actually combine these these two into a single track uh, up, in, up until that bar. So I now have these two flute parts, which unfortunately are not going to play because I need to relaunch uh, the Anna Ensemble Pro, um, on a single track. And they are playing these trills, which are not really uh, all that useful because it's going to sound pretty bad. Uh, again, I can't play, play it at the moment, but uh, actually, yes, I can. Um, let me just load up uh, that patch real quick. I'm using my flute. I'm going to my internal flute, which my internal flute. Where are you? There we go. I'll load BBC Orchestra. I'm gonna try to load BBC Orchestra. Okay, I'm, there we go. And I'm going to load my single flute. Okay, so right now I have the legato articulation selected. And this is this is actually going to be a really good uh, segue to the next thing I want to talk about, which, which is uh, expression maps and, and uh, switching articulations. So in this case, the legato actually does a pretty pretty good approximation of um, uh, of a trill. Problem is, if I try to play two trills at the same time, this is how it's going to sound. Uh, kind of good. So the problem with with uh, legato is, uh, for the most part, legato is a monophonic articulation. You can only play one note at a time, because as soon as you play another note, it's going to switch to the other note. Some libraries, such as the uh, Cine Samples libraries, have polyphonic legato. Um, I know Spitfire uh, symphonic uh, uh, libraries have the option of turning on polyphonic legato. I, I find that it doesn't work all that well, personally. Um, but uh, in order to get multiple voices playing a trill, I would have to select the long playing the trill that we saw in, in that uh, in that section, I can actually copy and paste it here, and it would sound something like this. So actually, not bad. Um, Lindsay, I will, I will answer that in just a second. Um, but it doesn't sound nearly go as good as this. And the trills in this case are actually not monophonic, which means I can have two two uh, instruments playing or uh, two flutes on a single track playing two trills. So I'm going to do this real quick. Let me all right. Let me do, let me uh, put a region on this so that I don't have to look at all the instruments that don't have regions. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it down here on, on my flute that will actually play. OK, so at the moment I have all of these notes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the upper notes and those upper notes. I'm shift clicking to select. 
Um, oh, this it's actually doing it. Okay, so I'm only going to be able to do it with, with this one. I'm going to, to merge all these together into a single sustain, sustained note. And then these three notes, I'm going to come up here to my articulations menu, which doesn't exist because I need to tell it what, which expression map to use. Uh, there, there we go. I'm, I'm going to explain what, what I just did in a second. I'm going to make these whole tone trill. And these I'm going to make long since it's actually doing a uh, minor third trill. And it's going to sound like this. Which actually doesn't sound half bad. Uh, thanks, David, for, for chiming in, in there. All right, so how did I get these notes to play trills? So I'm, I'm using something called expression maps in, in Cubase, and Cubase was, was the first DAW, as far as I know, to, uh, to have this. Logic has something uh, that is similar now called articulation sets. Digital Performer uh, um, also uh, introduced uh, something similar not too long ago. Um, Peter, you'll have to tell us if, if Reaper has something similar. Um, this is sort of a more contemporary uh, alternative to the old key switches. So with key switches, you would play keys that are out of the range of the instrument. So on a flute, uh, where we go down to C3 or, or middle C or, or B, just blow it. Um, so say you go down to C0 and C0 would be sustain and C and D zero would be uh, staccato, etc. And that's all great if uh, if you uh, if you're fast enough to click on the note um, before you you or the key switch rather before playing the note that you want, uh, or after you've recorded, you can go back and and you can input uh, C zero at C sharp. C zero here, and then say you want to go to, to that's a D. Uh, you want to go to staccato here, you, you play D, so the, the next notes, and basically at any notes that are played after you put in that key switch are going to be that particular articulation. With expression maps, you can actually have simultaneous expressions. They, they don't have to be limited by when the key switch is is, uh, is pressed or, or played. Um, so you can have this whole tone trill here, and this, these are actually all long, long notes, but very, very short played long notes, uh, which turn into a, uh, a minor third trill. And that's super useful. So the expression map set, uh, um, Options are, are over here on the left in the main window. Um, and as you can see, I have many, many, many expression maps set up. I actually use uh, uh, something called uh, Babylon Waves uh, Art Conductor, which is a paid preset for pretty much every library uh, in existence. And they come out with regular updates. Um, but I, before going out and spending the money on that, I would I would highly recommend practicing making your own uh, expression maps or articulation sets because they, while they're a little complex, um, they're they're fairly straightforward and understanding how they work and and uh, what you can do with them is is really key, especially if if you want to do something slightly different than what the preset is. Uh, yeah, David, you, you are correct. Um, I know I was, uh, Dell asks, is there a reason my expression map was not in my template? It was, but it was not, uh, not on my internal flute track because I might load any, any flute on that. So I, I don't have any expression map set up on that. And I feel like there was one other thing I was going to respond to. Um, oh, right. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to to show exporting out of uh, Dorico. Well, we'll probably make make these uh, workflow workshops a, a regular thing uh, as as questions come in, and we can focus on on different elements. Like I said, 
today is, is a very broad overview of, uh, of my, my process. Um, the, uh, the MIDI exports out of Dorico or Sibelius um, based on what's performing. And, and I, I see Charles, uh, you, you, you talked about that, how general MIDI uh, has less crap than the note performer. Um, so in my case, I actually have no perform performing in Dorico. So when I export the MIDI, all of the controller data uh, is, is no performer based. So on the one hand, there aren't too many crazy uh, controller messages that, that are irrelevant. On the other hand, it's not necessarily gonna translate right into, into um, my DAW. So, to, I'm, I'm gonna assume that not everybody understands what I mean when I say controller data. So let me go to my, this is just the flute track that got imported from, um, from uh, flute one from the MIDI. And I'm going to go here and show, uh, oh, I can't do it there. Hang on one second, I have a, Shortcut set up for this, which my computer, uh, I had to restart it just before we started. So not, nothing seems to be working as planned. As Reuven is uh, is taking care of that, I, I'm just kind of like in the flow of the conversation, both Reuven's and the sidebar conversation. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, there are so many tangents we could go on uh, describing different portions of this. So yeah, I too have ideas for future workflow workshops we could do. So please do feel free to ask your questions, even if we don't have the chance to answer them in full, they, they'll they become the basis for uh, you know future seminars of this type. Um, not to be like overly self-promotional, but uh, five or six years ago, I did an entire YouTube video on my personal YouTube channel on mocking up Star Wars. I, I literally played in every single part, uh, you know, one part at a time, one note at a time. Uh, first two pages of Star Wars, um, just to kind of illustrate my process of mocking up at that time. This was pre-expression maps, but I'm thinking to myself as you guys are talking, I was like, man, I should, I should do an updated version of that. Maybe we'll do it as, a, as an ASA event. That way um, everybody can just watch it in real time. That would be a different way to build the score than Ruben is currently talking about. But um, th this is a pretty complex technical thing and there's so many angles to come at it from. So today you're seeing one really great way and there are others too. So, sorry, Ruben, I'm just filling time while you're. Oh, uh... that that that's fine. Uh, I'm I'm gonna add to that uh, that that uh, in addition to promoting your YouTube channel, um, we've been talking about uh, about uh, using Discord as as a way to foster the ASA community. Yeah. Um, this is the kind of stuff that that would be great to to use Discord for is asking asking these kinds of questions because we we have uh we have a membership base that that is uh extremely knowledgeable um but we also have some people that are more at the beginning of their of their uh, journeys and um being able to ask for that kind of help i mean there are other forums as well but but uh th there's really nothing like uh trial and error to figuring it out for yourself and and i mean the the number one thing i would recommend uh, a, after uh, going in and downloading the bc uh, uh spitfire uh, core uh, library is just play around and and see what you can do and don't don't be afraid of uh, messing things up because you can always fix it afterwards um but but try on error and and getting to to know these things is is really key um i saw kareem asked about wild heart glissandi uh i i was maybe gonna get to that uh very much down, down the road uh, my my short answer is i like to play it in on all the white keys and then transpose to to whatever uh <laughs> what, whatever scale uh, the glissandi uh should be in that's uh, cheating but sure that <laughs> I, cheating is the name of the game. If, if you're not cheating, you're doing it wrong. The other approach, which I mentioned in the chat, is you could just slow down the tempo so that uh, you, you can play the exact scale and runs you want. With a bit of practice, that can be done too. Yeah. 
These are all techniques to avoid you from actually learning to be a better player, of course. But yeah. Uh, all right, give me one more minute because uh, I'm going to restart my uh, my slave computer and, and uh, get Vienna running so that I can actually play sounds out of everything that, that I've got. Um, so, so, so getting back to controllers, and now I can do my show use controllers. There we go. Okay. So I just hit a, uh, a button in Metagrid, which I'm not even going to get in, into today, um, showing use controllers. And this is actually the, the uh, data that's being used on, in the MIDI. Um, and I should say I already deleted volume and, and panning. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so what we have here are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and assume uh, volume and pan as well. So 10 different MIDI controllers with data on them. So this is coming out of the note performer, plus our notes themselves and the velocity. So all of that information is is in the original MIDI, and the majority of it is is um, useless, if not counterproductive, because it might actually counteract some of the things that that my libraries are are using. So, um, just a quick overview of uh, of. MIDI CC. CC is the controller, uh, uh, continuous controllers. Um, we've got four basic ones. We've got volume, CC7. We've got panning, CC10. We've got mod wheel or modulation wheel, CC1. And expression, CC11. Uh, and only one of those you're actually seeing here. So I'm going to discount uh, volume and panning right away because all of the libraries that I'm using and, and most uh, modern sample libraries, that information, well, the, the panning is in the sample itself. So, and if it's not in the sample, then I probably want to pan it uh, myself somewhere. And if you've got MIDI panning sending data, it's not going to do anything other than narrow the stereo image of, uh, of your instrument. So I want to get rid of panning information. And MIDI volume it, CC7 is very problematic because if it's contact in, instruments, for example, I don't have a contact instrument lo loaded up here, um, it, that'll, uh, that'll override the volume within contact, but you've got several different levels of uh, or stages of, of volume. And so all you're doing is, is limiting or, or maximizing that particular volume fader. So, I'm I'm getting rid of all the uh, uh, CC7 volume and CC10 panning information right away so that I don't mess anything up in, in my setup. Expression is a little bit tricky to, to explain because expression is essentially volume, except it's not. So um, before, before I talk about expression, let me talk about mod wheel. So for most, uh, for, for most sample libraries, mod wheel is the, it controls the dynamics of the instrument, or I should specify for, uh, for longer notes, the mod wheel contro controls the dynamics. So if the mod wheel is all the way down, it's gonna play pianissimo. If it's all the way up, it's gonna play fortissimo. Um, and, uh, and as I'm sure I don't need to tell you, the sound of a flute playing pianissimo is very different than playing fortissimo, not just at a volume level, but also the, the character of the sound itself, the, the timbre. Um, and so for long notes, and this includes trills and, and uh, uh, flutter, uh, basically any, any long notes um, with very few exceptions, mod wheel is going to control that or cc1 so i might play in let me uh let's see if this works there we go so i'm i'm playing in modulation and you can see 
that it, it played it recorded here. Um, or I might decide that I don't need to play it in. And the truth is, this is what I often do with with these mockups where I'm using the existing MIDI. I'm going to draw it in instead. And in this case, I'm I'm looking at the score, which Jorico does not want to uh, launch naturally. Um, so I'm just going to bring up the PDF here, see if I can find. OK, here, here's this flute run here. And they are crescendoing into a sforzando, which I'm going to assume is forte, and then, and then crescendoing in the second uh, run up into fortissimo. So for my mod wheel, I'm going to crescendo into forte, so maybe three quarters of the way up, but it's forzando, so I'm going to come down a little bit. And then I'm going to crescendo into fortissimo, which is basically going to be all the way up. Now, you might be asking, is, is there a difference between three quarters of the way up and, and all the way up? And I'm going to say, well, it depends on the library. How many different dynamic levels have, have they sampled at? Um, I actually don't know for BBC Symphony Orchestra offhand. Uh, as David says, libraries vary widely. Usually, it's somewhere between two and five different levels for uh, or layers um, for, for most orchestral instruments. Um, so if it's two, it's piano and forte. And the difference between a, a uh, value of 95, as I am here, or 127, which is all the way up here, um, is just going to be, be that this is slightly louder than this, but doesn't sound any different because it's just playing back the same sample. Um, on the other hand, if it's recorded at five different layers, you've got pianissimo, piano, mezzo, piano de forte, forte, and fortissimo, then there will be a difference in, in the way the note sounds between forte and fortissimo, depending on, on where, where the exact transition is. And a lot of this is just using your ears. Um, some of it is is uh, knowing the libraries, and I cannot em emphasize enough: know your libraries. Um, yeah, right. um, P yeah. Peter just mentions there's also different ways that libraries are programmed, so they vary so much. You, you know, even the number of velocity layers is not necessarily a, a tell on how the instrument will actually play in reality. So, as Ruben was drawing that that expression curve. What you really want to do as you're getting into this world is draw an expression curve and then play it back, like listen to it orally and see if it has the acoustic results that you want. Maybe you did too much, maybe you did not enough, maybe like the, the meat of the instrument, it lies in a certain part of the, of the expression or velocity curve. So you do that and in doing so you kind of start to learn your instruments and then when you get advanced at it, you can listen less because you already know how they're going to respond in advance. Exactly. And Julian says uh, Spitfire uh, BBC Orchestra has three dynamic la layers. So basically, there wouldn't be too much difference between uh, 95 or 100 and, and 127. Um, by the way, the, the values, in, in case you're uh, interested, all, all MIDI values are 8-bit, uh, which, which is 250, uh, sorry, 128. Um, I guess it is 256, but I guess it was it would be half of that, so seven bit. Um, so, but instead of starting from one, it starts from zero. So zero is the minimum, and 127 is the maximum. Um, so 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 mod wheel, like I said, is is dynamic level for most long notes. Expression is volume, but it's not volume. If that makes any sense. Expression for almost everything is going to be akin to volume. In other words, if your expression is at zero, you're not going to hear anything. And if it's at 127, that's as loud as it gets. And the, be the best uh, distinction uh, I've heard is, is the diff difference between expression and volume 
his volume is is like the fader on a mixing console. So if you tell a player play louder, they're not going to walk over to the mixing console and turn the knob up. They're going to play louder. And they can play louder even if they're still playing pianissimo. They they, they know how to make the sound come out more. Um, so expression basically gives you a way of of finessing what you're doing with modulation or with with other controllers and giving yourself additional curves. So let's say that that I really want to emphasize this sforzando, uh, and let's say I want to add a, a bit of a crescendo to it. I can draw that in here, and then I have a nice sforzando with a bit of a crescendo, even though it's very minute. But at least it's it's bringing that performance to life. And that's something that, that you can either play in with the with fa uh, faders. I've I've got a Novation Launch Control XL controller which I have mapped to uh, to all the MIDI controllers that I use. Um, or you can draw it in the way I just did to to bring your performance to life. Um, now the rest the rest of these controllers. This is note performer information which I'm probably going to want to delete because otherwise it, it might mess up uh, MIDI controllers that, that are assigned to different parameters and libraries that I'm using. I don't know offhand. So CC 16, 18, 19, 20, 24, and 25. I'm going to, um, well, I'll, I'll show you how I do it with the uh, volume and panning. I go into my MIDI logical editor I have these presets delete CC10 and CC7 and I could edit, I could edit those to get rid of these controllers as well and I could set up a macro to do it all at once. So if I import my note performer information then I'm going to delete all that information. But maybe I don't want to delete volume, maybe I want to copy volume over to modulation so that I have all that information that was originally volume giving me the dynamic levels, which is which is what I generally do. So um, and thank thank you Alvaro for uh, for reinforcing that. CC11 that that is the magic uh, touch. Right. There's there's no way to have a flute and low register sounding for fortissimo with CC11. So this is this starts getting into the minutia of of programming these uh, these instruments and getting them to sound realistic. So I'm still rebooting and, and loading Vienna Ensemble Pro, but I do ha do have some in instruments uh, loaded locally. Now I haven't really done anything to these. Th these are the uh, Aaron Venture Infinite Horn uh, Brass and Woodwinds. Um, so these are basically just using the modulation imported from what a uh, note performer had. But this, this is how it sounds without, without tweaking anything. And I should note that these instruments are not, they don't have different articulations. They're meant to be performed live. So I, I probably would not do it this way if I were using this instruments for an actual mock-up. This is just for demonstration purposes, but here's how it sounds. Not not great. Um, I th I think that some some of this other uh, info is getting in, in the way because it should should sound better out of the box. But if I were j just to grab one horn and and play it, so I'm so I'm playing with my right hand and I'm I'm using my left hand to ride the uh, the faders. But actually, the way I would generally do this is is using my uh, breath controller. So let me uh, grab that. So 
So now already it's starting to have a little bit of life. In, in fact, let me. Uh... But let me. I'm I'm just going to replace this first uh, horn. So everything, and I'm going to play back the original recording. So I'm so I'm going to be playing along with the recording, like I said. Unfortunately, there's no prep here. I played the wrong notes, but uh, it's actually C, G, G. Um, what is this breath controller? So this breath controller sadly is is no longer available except used on eBay. Um, th this is a Yamaha BC3A breath controller, which only works with uh, Yamaha keyboards. Um, there is a USB breath controller that's available. Uh, I, I believe this has come out up in the past. Uh, Tech Control, I think is the name of the company. They're, they're based in Europe and I, I believe they actually ship it out of Europe, so it's kind of expensive. Um, basically, this just sends a single controller. In, in my case, I have it mapped to, to modulation. Um, the default is, is CC2 is actually breath controller. That, that was in, in the MIDI standards, the, uh, the um, breath controller number. Uh, it's fair, fairly unusual, but I find it very convenient and very intuitive. I don't really play any wind instruments other than a little bit of recorder uh, as a little kid, but uh, in terms of not just blowing at the uh, at the level that makes sense, also adding those those little uh, nuances of uh, sforzando and crescendos. Um, sure, you can you can do it with a fader, but performing it I find is incredibly intuitive with with a breath controller. So there we go. Da David uh, just uh, posted the uh, the link in there. Um, so so that's often how I'll record things. Now, why would I want to record things if I've already got the MIDI in them? Well, for one thing, the performance looks a lot different, and that was probably you can see. I played earlier than, than the note. I've got a little bit of latency going on here, but uh, here I was a little bit off. I'm, I'm not, I've got the score on, on my other window, so you're not seeing the score. Um, but if you, if you play this in, it's not gonna sound as perfect, but it's gonna sound more human. And in this case, I'm, I'm really going fortissimo, which I think, uh, I think is maybe a little bit too much. I might, bring that down a little bit. Um, but that, that'll that give you a performance that sounds alive rather than this. Which sounds very dead. Um, so, so when it comes to melodic lines, more often than not, I will play it in. Uh, I find it's also good practice for, for performing it. And as, as David said, you can always slow things down and, and play it at a, at a uh, slower volume. In fact, you could even set the recording. Let me see if I can do this real quick. Um, I'm going to make the recording musical. And I'm going to switch to this tempo. I don't know if this is going to work or not. I go to actually no. Um. So in in some DAWs, well, in most DAWs, you you can you can have the audio follow your tempo. So. I just switched the audio to follow tempo of the recording. 
and I'm just going to bring this down. Let's see how this sounds. Not that didn't work. Um, so, but, but that's certainly an option with, with certain cues, you slow things down and record at a slower tempo and then speed it up and no, but no one will be any the wiser. <laughs> I, uh, yes, I, uh, Charles, I, I, Practice makes perfect, but but uh, I I I too uh, f feel that often my performances are not adequate, and that's why quantizing is is very useful as well. So if I were to quantize this to quarter note, da, 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 uh, eighth eighth note triplets. So I set my uh, my grid here to eighth note triplets. Uh, this might be a little bit weird. Um, does everybody know what, what quantizing is? is do, do I need to uh, give a bit of a background? or So if I were just to quantize it to the grid. That one's off. I believe this this one is actually a sixteenth note, so I'm gonna change that. So now now it's quantized exactly, but now we're getting back into the issue of it sounding too robotic. So what I'm gonna do, actually, let me just do it up and up until there with our eighth note triplet, is I'm going to what in Cubase is called soft quantize. So I'm going to reset quantize. I'm going to quantize again, but this time, rather than quantizing 100%, I quantized 80%. So everything is 80% closer to where it's supposed to be, but it's still not exact. Now, now we're starting to get somewhere where it sounds like a good performance without sounding like a robotic performance. Um, let me get the Vienna Ensemble Pro loading here because I see that. Uh, so diff different instruments within a section, Kareem asks. Well, I, first of all, it depends on, on what libraries you have. Um, I personally, I'm, I don't really use, uh, the Berlin stuff. I'm not a big, big fan of their, uh, interface, but, um, what I'll sometimes do is I'll use two different libraries for different instruments. So if I have flute one and flute two, I'll use my Spitfire woodwinds, uh, Spitfire symphonic woodwinds for flute one. There you go, Al Alvaro uh, uses uh, Berlin Brass. And I'll use, say, uh, Cinewin's flute uh, as flute two, or vice versa, depending on, on, uh, on the sound. And that allows me to, to be more flexible in terms of having uh, legato, for example, uh, as, as I mentioned before, more monophonic. Um, and it also lets you have two different uh, sounds. Now, you could, in theory, load the same flute for, uh, from the same library for two different parts. But, and this is very important, if they're playing unison, you're going to start running into, into trouble because it's playing back the same samples. And when you're playing back the same samples at the same time, you start getting phasing. Uh, where where things sound weird, um, so I would be careful about using two instances of the of the same instrument if if they're playing unison. I think it's fine if if they're playing different lines, 
Um, it's better if you have different libraries to use or using Berlin Woodwinds or, or the uh, Aaron Venture uh, stuff, which also has, they have actually th three Woodwinds, I think, I think Berlin Woodwinds does as well, or they have two plus, plus their solo, their soloists. Um, but at the same time, if I go back to my, my uh, Berlin Woodwind flute, if I've got short notes here, I'm just going to play in. Well, that sounds great. There's, that sounds like two flutes playing uh, uh, sh short, short notes together. So it's really not a problem to use a single patch as long as it's not legato lines. Um, and Charles says, right, reacting differently to CC values. Right, so if you have one, one instrument playing a crescendo at the same time as another is playing a decrescendo, well, you, you can't do that on the same track. So you you could load two two tracks with the same instrument on different tracks and do it, or use separate instruments from separate libraries, or or separate instruments from the same library in a library like Berlin. Um. All right. So, does anybody have? Uh, I mean, I'm sure there there are lots of questions, but I I do want to move on to the end of the process, which is um, exporting, bouncing, and, and then uh, uh, and then creating a, a, a version that we can play back from and, and isolate elements. Because as you can see from today, do, doing this in real time is very risky because things uh, tend to not uh, stop working for, inexplicably. Uh, Murphy's law in action, and and so the end goal is to have audio stems that that we load up and and play back as we're doing a score study. Um, how do I record staccato if the articulation can be applied only after notes recorded? Good question. So um, with with the uh, Babylon Arts uh, Babylon Waves conductor so that's a tricky one um they have standardized uh i'm going to call them key switches even even though they're they're not really key switches but basically they by default they are mapped where long note is is the very bottom note of midi which is c minus two which is two, c two octaves below the bottom of a keyboard um that note does exist in midi even if I don't think there's any instrument that can actually play it. Um, let me know if, if you know otherwise. But uh, they basically have these uh, these mapped. So that uh, Novation controller they talked about has 16 buttons at the bottom. And I have those buttons mapped to those uh, controllers. So 128 foot pipe organ. I, would that even be audible? So, somebody uh, do the math. Uh, um so the the first eight are long legato marcato tremolo spiccato which often is interchangeable with short because technically spiccato is just strings but uh staccatissimo for uh for woodwinds and brass staccato short which is neither spiccato nor sta uh, staccato and pizzicato and obviously those don't always exist i mean uh you'd be hard pressed to play pizzicato on a flute uh i'm sure the flute player would uh, would yank it away um and so i can i can press those and, and play those and actually cubase didn't used to do this it now actually records that articulation as i play it in which, which is a nice uh, improvement in in logic uh, you can toggle whether or not uh, that happens with with the articulation sets um otherwise 
I'll go in and, and uh, mark them after I've recorded. So I might record everything just as long notes and then go in and, and adjust it so that it's whatever uh, articulations uh, I need it to be. Um, right, I, that's what we were just talking about. And I, I know uh, Dell, you asked earlier about VST3 and, and note control over, uh, note by note control. So that is separate from CC data. CC data is, is general MIDI. Um, individual note expression is, uh, is specific to VST3. And as far as I know, only Cuba or only Steinberg uh, uh, libraries use it. I think also the uh, the, the um, audio modeling uh, model instruments uh, can make use of it, even though it, it has a huge performance hit. So I don't. I generally don't use that. Um, well, see you. Uh, see you later, Jeff. Enjoy the uh, ASMAC event. Um, so once, once everything has been, uh, has been done, I'm going to create stems. So stems can mean, mean a lot of different things to different people, but in this case, I'll probably put the flutes on their own stem, the piccolos on their own stem, etc. So Cubase actually makes this nice and easy especially if, if your template is set up oh, i haven't even talked about the template yet um <clears throat> i've i've got <clears throat> actually I, I deleted a bunch but i might have set a different instrument uh, tracks for flutes oboes english horn clarinet oh i'm gonna switch over to multiple channel selection so in cubase you can you can bounce multiple tracks at once so I'm going to bounce flutes, oboes, English horn, clarinet, bass clarinet, bassoon, um, trumpets, horns, trombones, bass trombone, tuba. So each of these is going to bounce as its own stem. And I would then have individual audio stems of, of each of those elements. So if nobody objects i'm going to close this session i'm going to open up a uh a logic session actually so i'm going to quit cubase if we have time i'll come back to that and show a little bit of of my setup with uh, vienna ensemble pro if uh, if that finishes loading uh, before we wrap up I can tell one of the challenges with uh, this whole topic is there's all kinds of levels from people who have never done this before and are trying to get a, a foothold in at, at an entry level. Then there's probably some of you out there who have done some of this before and already have personal preferences for I like to do it this way or that way. Or, um, you know, while Ruben's loading this, it might be useful if you if you have even like big questions, things you'd like to see if we were to do future workflow workshops. Um, we'd love to know about them. We'll save all these ideas and and take them into consideration. Um, I have some ideas for things I may uh, do in the future, but uh, also if you would consider yourself an intermediate or an expert at uh, your workflow, if you have an, a personal approach to this kind of stuff, um, let us know. We would love to um, to talk with you and maybe you can host or co-host an event in the future explaining different corners of this entire art. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Kyle, uh, this particular score that we're working with, which is our, part of our current Superman study, which, by the way, just in case you don't know, next week we're doing part three of the Superman study, so highly encourage you to join. Same time as this, just next Saturday. Um, this particular Superman suite, uh, yeah, it's a handwritten score, and it was kind of the best representation we could find of being able to look at uh, that particular score of John Williams um, in a concise but but expanded way so yeah that's a pretty cool thing and um when you join us for our for actual superman study you'll see that uh, it's already been mocked up in dorico which, so it's what you saw but nice and clean and legible right uh, Lindsay points out another another approach is uh to look at this from the point of view of a notation program like dorico or sibelius 
and then see how you can mock up from there. That I think is worth an entire event on its own. Things where we can get into things like uh, Note Performer or the new Muse score offering, which looks really interesting. Um, yeah, lots to talk about on that, but probably too big a topic for today. So, so I would just uh, tack on to that. Um, notation programs are are not intended to be uh, mockup programs. I mean, the, the mockups are are really intended to be just for reference. Um, I mean, it is true that no performer do, does a pretty good job, and and uh, um, the uh, what's the what's the new one you mentioned, David? The new Muse Score offering. Muse Score, right. Yeah, it's built into Muse Score, and that one's free. Right. Um, they they do sound better, and it is true that Dorico has has uh, some options for adjusting the way that notes play back, which is useful because. Uh, there was nothing worse than than uh, having having something and and uh, it, every time it would play back sounding completely wrong. There was nothing you could do about it. But uh, and and Daniel Spreadbury, the creator of Dorico, is is very clear about this. Dorico is not meant to be a scoring program. It's not not meant or not meant to be a program for creating playback. The, the playback is secondary to to the notation and the engraving. Um, so, I mean, by all means, it would, it would be great to uh, to talk about how how you can make things sound better. Honestly, with Note Performer, there's almost no flexibility. It's <laughs> what what you get is uh, what you get. Um, but but uh, but I I would caution you against. Uh, you using a notation program to try and get really high quality sounding mockups out of it. So I've pulled up, this is a uh, study we did several years ago of uh, the planets and uh, the most famous uh, planet Mars. Um, so you can see that this is the original uh, recording of uh, BBC, not not the BBC Orchestra, this is the Proms Orchestra, uh, Albert Hall, thank you. Um, and if I hit play, you'll, you'll see. And we talked earlier about temple mapping, and if I turn on the click, Listen to the violins. So by exporting stems the way I talked about, isolating individual elements, and, and we can even do this to the level of I have oh somebody's drawing on my screen. Um, we can even do this to the level of let's find oh there's a nice close up of the harp playing. Let's let's just listen to the harp. So you re you really get uh, th this fantastic isolation that you would never have in in real life, um, like the violins playing Colenio there, which if I go back to the original recording. You're not really hearing the violins. They're playing weight. That you're hearing, but but you're not hearing the uh, the second violins pl playing uh, down on their uh, lowest uh, C. Um, but 
when we then look at the score and, and want to see what something sounds like just a certain section or a certain instrument, uh, that was Colenio. Um, we can that that's what enables us to dissect these scores in a way that makes them at least to me personally far more accessible rather than trying to imagine based on looking at the score what it would sound like and the other thing we can do is is take things out so let's say we want to hear um everything other than the brass <laughs> Silent trombone. So basically our our goal for for these mock-ups which is uh different from from uh, different in in certain ways from doing mock-ups for realism is to allow this kind of uh dissection of the score um so you would never mix the colenio uh, violins that loud uh because it just it sounds kind of ridiculous but it's useful for hearing what they're actually doing when in in real life that's more just a, a tiny little uh, texture added to to the rhythm uh, um that that everybody's playing uh so that that is the purpose of uh, of the mock-ups that we're doing um I think that's as a general overview all I've got. I can I can try and open, I've got Vienna Ensemble Pro open here, so I can go back and, and show a little bit more of that and and uh, how I've got that set up. Um, but please, by all means, let me know uh, if if anybody has any questions. Yes, there there is stuff left to do for next week. We've got. Uh, We've got the last 50 bars or so of, of uh, the Superman theme that are still pending. I'm, I'm planning on tackling some of that myself. Uh, but if, if anybody uh, is interested in, in uh, joining in, that would be welcome. This is an inter interesting question from Bernard about whether there might be AI stem separation tools in the future. I'm I'm a little doubtful. Uh, it's not to say it would never happen, but I mean today we have stem separation tools that can take pop mixes and can do a, a passable job at isolating drums, bass, guitars, keys, and so on. But even they they're a long way from like being perfect. And the thought of of being able to take an entire orchestral recording and separating it down to the stem. I, I, you might as well be sifting grains of sand on a beach and sorting them for color at that point, because the effect of an orchestra playing all at once is that it's not, it's not mush, but I mean, that's the, that's the layman's thing. Like you're getting all of these instruments making one ensemble sound. Uh, so extracting it is probably near impossible, but a cool fantasy. Um, lots of questions coming in. Yeah, no, that that's great. So uh, I'll, I'll go one at a time. First of all, Barbara, good good eyes. Uh, my secret is I'm not on a, a uh, Silicon Mac. I'm I'm still using a 2019 uh, MacBook Pro with uh, with an Intel uh, i9 chip. So um, I believe I thought Cubase was uh, Silicon compatible, but I might be wrong. I I know not all plugins are yet. Um. All right, are mockups used for remixing old mono recordings to true stereo? I that's a good question. I think more more common is to re-record uh, th the orchestra. I know there have been some uh, some uh, well-known cases uh, uh, where where orchestrations have been um, taken and, and redone or even recreated because the original manuscripts uh, don't exist anymore. 
Um, I know, uh, was it uh, Joel McNeely who, uh, who who did? I'm trying to remember what what he did, but uh, that, I think that's more more common. Um, I mean, I love being able to create mockups. I'll I'll take real orchestra any day of the week uh, if if I've got the option. It's uh, e e even though I know uh, uh, this this came up before. Some people do uh, do claim that they prefer the precision of of mockups and and really good sounding mockups uh, that that you can't tell if if they're real or not. Um, I I mean the, this may just be the uh, the purest in me, but uh, I I feel like uh, the human element that that live players, uh, as uh, Don Williams used to say. Um, Moving air in a, in a room, or maybe that was Ron. Uh, in any case, I, I, I find find that profound. Yeah, we uh, we've talked about this with Tim Davies a lot in the past. Uh, Tim is very pragmatic about this, and he's most of his work is on scoring stages, um, and he'll just point point blank say, "There's certain things that the samples do better than um, live players." Uh, string harmonics can be an example of that. Just tuning yeah. string harmonics in the room is tricky and it's very time consuming and the samples just do it perfectly. So if it ain't broke, there can be a case made for, you know, sometimes there's things that samples do do better. But as far as traditional full ensemble, traditional playing, the live ensemble would still do it better. So, but I mean, I, I kind of like the pragmatic approach. If it works, if you're happy with the sound, go with it. Or create yeah. keyboards. There's nothing uh, um, recording live ensemble or live strings or live brass. Um, you know, it, it all it all depends on the score and what the score needs. Also, uh, if it's woodwind heavy, then you will be probably benefit from live woodwinds. But if it's woodwind minimal, maybe you can get away with uh, sampled woodwinds if the parts are such that the samples can render them well. And all, always on the assumption that you just don't have the budget to do it with live players. Um, Mur Murphy still uh, still acting up here, but uh, the key to all this, I'm, I'm as, able uh, able to connect. The key to all this, as mentioned constantly through this through our time together, is you just have to have one unified tempo map. Like as long as you agree on what the tempo of this piece is going to be, or you know, it's it's tempo changes over time, you can combine all kinds of you can do all kinds of combinations of different types of recording and producing. So um, Jared asked, do I roll off the lows for the mockups? Uh, I sometimes will. The truth is I, I don't consider myself an expert at mixing. Um, so I, I've got certain tricks that I use, but, but I will defer to those who are more knowledgeable than I am. Uh, what I will say is, is sometimes when putting together like the uh, logic session that I showed earlier, um, if I notice that there's a lot of low end on certain stems, I, I will roll roll that off for sure just to prevent there from being too much build up um but not not as a general rule um mike asks about uh creating uh two flutes one set to legato and what right so um so mike let, like i said the articulations are not Oh, you know what? Let me show you, show this in the horns because I know I know that I did. Uh... Yeah, there we go. So the articulations, despite the fact that you can see them down here, you can have two simultaneous articulations at the same time. So at, at the moment, all of these are playing staccato, but let's say I wanted to make the bottom one muted staccato for some bizarre reason. The bottom note is now going to play muted staccato while the top two play regular staccato. And if I, well, let me say what, that was out of thing. Let me mute, mute those. So now you can hear that those are actually muted. Um, so basically, uh, this is uh, a, a key distinction between if, if I open up my that shortcut key, 
my expression map setup, I used to use direction and I've changed everything to attribute because attribute allows you to do that direction basically. I, I wish Cubase would, would overhaul this whole system because it's uh, as useful as it is, it's also very clunky. Direction basically is like saying Arco or boss well, since I've got horns, like saying muted. So if I gave the direction mute, then as long as they're muted, as long as I've said mute, they're gonna play with mutes until I say open. Attribute is a is supposed to be the kind of articulation that can be per note. So say staccato, where you would just have a staccato marking on, on a note. What I've discovered through way too much trial and error is direction actually causes a lot of issues, especially when you've got lots of different articulations where you ha you have to find the right uh, channel and, and draw it in on that particular channel. This is actually relatively low. Some, some, some tracks have 30, 40 different, uh, di different uh, articulations. And so it's a lot easier for me just to select them to go to this drop down menu and, and click on the one that uh, the articulation that I'm looking for. Um, wow, 15 new messages. All right, let me, let me uh, Charles asks about uh, creating tracks for four horns. Ah, okay, so per perfect example. So in this case, the horns are playing unison um, for this first, uh, now I can play it back. So helpfully, the BBC Symphony Orchestra actually has four horns in unison um, as, as their section, which is, I go back to, I, I close the score. Uh, but the score is written for four horns. I'm, I, I do wonder if the original film was four horns or six. Uh, it seems like six would have been uh, more powerful for Superman. But uh, in, in this particular uh, arrangement, it's four horns. So here they're playing four horns unison. And if you listen to it soloed, you can hear that it does indeed sound like multiple horns. Sorry about the playback. And at that moment, then it goes to VZ. So I'm actually cheating here because there's one voice that's duplicated. The, the I believe it's actually low, lowest voice, um, but I'm going to my single horns playing staccato. So that's, that's the trick for switching between one horn and, and four horns. Now it means I need to to go through the entire part and figure out what's what's unison and, and what's not. So if I go to this section here, um, so you can you can see that it gets tricky because they're mm -hmm. playing unison. Well, here I'll, I'll solo it. <laughs> it's defaulting to legato which means that that you're not hearing all the notes um so what i would actually do here in fact let me do it really quickly so all right so i'm i'm going to put all of these on a single track i'm gonna make them a single region i'm gonna so th this is this is my pro process all these long notes are going to be sustained or long. All of these short ones, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to make uh, uh, probably staccatissimo because I we you know what? let's make this first da 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 da. We'll make that marcado and see how that works. Again, this is this is knowing your libraries and what what marcado actually means because marcado can mean different things in in different places. All right, 
And now I'm going to do this. I'm going to duplicate this to my four horns track. And I'm going to mute everything that's being played by individual horns. I'm going to leave that top line. I'm muting all of that. I'm going to, to go to my single horn track. I'm going to mute everything that's being played by by four horns unison. I'm going to, I'm going to mute the top line in the end. So here they're splitting two and two. And with this instrument combination, I don't have any way of doing two horns. I can either do one horn or four horns. So basically what I'm doing is three horns on the top and one on the bottom. I'm cheating to, to give myself the best uh, the best option. So now if I toggle between them, you can see, first of all, all of the articulations have been copied over. So I didn't have to do that multiple times. And I'm also just gonna draw in for Tizimo mod wheel. So here's how it sounds now. Okay, a little glitchy if I play back again. I don't know why this is sounding so funky. I'm going to try changing that to Mercado and see if that, if that helps. Let's bring up the I, I think it just needs better. These I'm also going to bring up the uh, velocity. Now this is working really quickly. So it, and these also need to be brought up because they're almost inaudible. I, I kind of feel like pointing out that Re Ruben's approach right now is very purist. He's assigning everything to either one or four. Um, like in reality, you can do whatever you want. Like you just use your ears. And if you like the sound, you could even use both at the same time if that gets you the acoustic result you want. Um, your ear is king. And you know you can see that with him adjusting the velocities. Like that just made the, that section come to life and it made the staccatos and ricardos speak much clearer. So in the end, it always comes down to just use your ear, even if it's technically wrong from a traditional writing point of view, um, make it sound like what you want it to sound like. Right. Um, many composers and, will, will frequently even layer different articulations than in the real world you couldn't actually layer. But if they sound right, if they sound good, you've accomplished your task. Exactly. And, and I, I should point out these articulations, I mean, th these are based on what the library calls the articulations. They are often not um, not so um, exact. So at least they're calling it staccatissimo instead of spiccato. But if you notice, there's no staccato. In other words, it's staccatissimo or nothing. Um, <laughs> whereas it bugs me. Yeah. Right. Whereas marcato, some some libraries will be a short sample some it'll be a medium sample and some some it'll be a sustained just with a uh, an accent an accented attack mm -hmm. so so it, it gets very tricky that's why i said knowing the libraries is is key and knowing how how they're going to respond to to this kind of thing um and just the process of setting up so i mean you you see how easy it is for me to select individual articulations but what what you're not seeing so now now i can share a screen and and uh or do, do my inception sharing again is the hours and days and weeks and months of setting up each library in vienna ensemble pro so in this case so here's my BBC horn. So first of all, just making sure that this is on uh, MIDI port 25 of the brass instance uh, channel three, whereas the four horns is channel four. And if I come here, you see brass 25 channel three and the four horns is channel four. 
So that in itself is time consuming, <laughs> making sure every, everything lines up. And then in this case, I, ha I haven't adjusted the key switches. I've used the default because that's what uh, the Babylon uh, Waves R conductor uses. But in many cases, I am, uh, I am using um, custom key switches and I'll, I'll have to program them all in myself. And so setting up the template is, is key to being able to work this quickly uh, as you're going along. And, and those, those of you who, who've studied with me privately know that uh, I'm, I'm very big on, on taking the time to uh, create your templates and, and making sure everything works properly. Uh, it, it, it is incredibly time consuming, but that's, that's what allows you then to do this kind of quick work and make it sound decent with, with very little effort. Um, and, and I still would, if I had the time would, would tweak this further, I might decide since these are, these are, uh, short notes da, 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 that, that I want them to be shorter. By the way, I'm using key commands to shorten and extend notes by, by this value. Um, those are all things that that I've set up as as custom uh, key commands uh, again because I I figured out over time that that's something that's very useful. This maybe should be longer. I feel like it's not long enough. Da, 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 there's almost no break there. So, um, and and the way I sang it was more like. Da. Da, 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 have have that little uh, crescendo in there. So now now it sounds like this, if it plays back at all. There we go. Now now it's got more life to it because we've got that little little uh, swell. I'm not sure if it's actually in the score that way, but uh, it fe feels like uh, that would make sense. All right, we're almost out of time because we, we want to let people uh, join join the ASCAP. Uh, Dave, were were there any other uh, questions uh, that that I missed? That uh... you know, I think within the scope of uh, of today's event, we got uh, we we covered this part of the process. But now, like I mentioned earlier, there's many offshoots of this that we will want to tackle in the future. So, um, really, thank you so much, Reuven, for walking us through a lot of your process. Um, that was really informative and a lot of a lot of little tricks that you can pick up, you know, to, to enhance your realism in your mock-ups uh, goes without saying, we need to do more of this, of course. So um, please do let us know uh, ideas you have for things you want us to cover. And um, we will, we will try and get to as much as possible. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, but next week, same time, same channel, uh, we will be covering Superman, the last section of the Superman suite, which is the big hero theme. Uh, so you'll actually, <laughs> fingers crossed, be able to play back our full mock-up of that and isolate it and actually kind of apply some of these techniques to, and look at how John Williams implemented them himself in his writing. So, and then beyond that, we're, uh, we've got a, a really exciting slate of scores and guests we're going to be announcing uh, coming later this spring and throughout the year. So if you want to get involved, please, uh, please join us. Anything else? Uh, I would just say, um, I will uh, try and have Discord uh, open on my computer, so uh, feel free to uh, to keep sending questions in. And if there's anything that I didn't get a chance to answer uh, today, uh, again, this was a very broad and, and brief overview, I, not comprehensive by any means. So ho hopefully nobody tuned in expecting to uh, to become an expert at, at mockups uh, after a two hour session. But uh, I'm I'm happy to uh, continue answering questions uh, over on Discord. So. Uh, uh, yeah. Hopefully, I'll see you there. Yeah, that's that's very 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 valuable. We'll also look at um, the the integration of notation programs into the flow of what we're talking about, like the pros and cons of using Dorico or Sibelius or Finale to set up scores, and then how do we maximize the realism out of those? That's a whole separate topic that a couple people uh, touched on. Uh, there's a link for Discord. It's up in the chat above, or I'll see if we can find it again. Um, I don't have it in front of me anymore. Uh, no, yes, I do. Hold on. Oh, copy. There we go. Discord link is coming up in the chat right now. 
Oh, yeah. Thank you, Aleph. Um, yeah, great. Well, uh, I think that's everything. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for, for being with us today. And uh, we hope to see you at future ones, including next week. So 